Brandon uh-huh. Cooks, a new member of the Dallas Cowboys. Let's just jump right in, Aaron. What exactly are the Cowboys getting in Brandon Cooks now at this stage of his career? Brandon is a very high character individual. He's also very fast and he's tough. He's someone that can easily get open, take the top off the defense. He's an impactful player. And I feel like the last couple of years, you know, the team that he was playing on wasn't very good, didn't have very good quarterback play. But, you know, when you think about what he was doing when they had Deshaun Watson, what he was able to do when he was with the Los Angeles Rams, the Patriots, the Saints, he's always been productive. And, you know, it, he made a lot of sense when he said, you know, and I, he's told me this many times, when you get traded a lot, it's because you have value. He's never, ever had to go through free agency. He's never been cut by a team. He's always valued, and that says a lot. And it's you know, kind of a false narrative here that I think a lot of fans and some of our uh, homer media, uh, like I like to call them, buy into. He's a great guy, and he is so respected in the Texans locker room and any locker room he's been in. And uh, you know, he's just a high-level person. He was my neighbor, uh, but he's moving now. <laughs> <laughs> in Dallas, but uh, he had a great first day. I texted with him a little while ago. He's very excited. He is just so happy to be in Dallas, and uh, we were talking about this for a couple of days before it got official, and he he was almost like he had to pinch himself. He was so excited because he wanted so badly to be in Dallas during the season, and it didn't work out. There were some snags there about you know Nick Casario and how much the money they would pay and also what would the draft pick compensation be, and this time it got worked out, and the Cowboys made out better on this deal than they would have during the season. So it was a good trade for the Jones family and a good trade for Brandon. And the Texans, they were ready to move on. They were – obviously they accepted that he was very firm. He reiterated to D'Amico Ryans, I don't want to play for the Texans. I don't want to play for a team that doesn't have an established quarterback that's not ready to win. So being with Dak Prescott, that's really a dream come true for him. And, uh, you know, in interviewing – Brandon yesterday, a real plus for him was to get this done early so he can start getting ready and get his family settled. He wanted to uh, get his wife and his kids into Dallas and learn the city and then, you know, be around Dak and hopefully play some catch soon. And those are things that are important for him. He spends a lot of money on maintaining his body, has a lot of trainers and therapists to work with him to keep himself finally tuned. So, yeah, they get a guy with a great work ethic that loves football and loves everything about it, loves to train, loves practice, and is really competitive. And I, I tell you what, those one-on-ones with Diggs, and, you know, Stefan Gilmore, who's his friend from their days with the Patriots, I think it's going to be really special. I think it's uh, going to give him a real shot in the arm because losing really bothered him. He was just one of these guys that he took it hard and was upset. You know, it bothered him to lose, and I think he handled it the best way he could. At one point, though, when the trade didn't happen, he was frustrated, so he missed that one game, and then he came back. And he wasn't a team captain anymore, but he still played hard and set a good example, regardless of the status of the captain thing, which is, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I mean, I look at Brandon a lot differently than some other people did, uh, but, you know, some of that's just like, oh, you don't want to play for the Texans, and, you, you know, what's wrong with you? No. It's called free will. He's it's his career, his life. He doesn't want to play here, and they accommodated him. And he thanked Nick Casario and his agent Ryan Solder, and he thanked the Cowboys. He was just he was appreciative. He's very grateful. Well, you gave us a very extensive breakdown. You painted the picture of a consummate pro, and I'm sure there's a lot of Cowboys fans who are excited about that. I know, and you've you've kind of alluded to this in some ways. There was kind of. A question about what happened from, you know, wanting to buy into a rebuild to then obviously wanting to play for a contender, which, you know, kind of pretends the move to Dallas. Can you shed a little bit more light on that situation? I'm sorry, broke up a little bit as far as what led to the trade or I'm sorry. No, just because I mean, obviously, from what we hear is that he was in on the idea of a rebuild in Houston, and eventually wanted to oh, play for change. contender. Yeah, 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 yeah. So just, I mean, obviously, you've you've painted a picture of a very consummate uh, pro, and I just want to have more information yeah, would, on that portion of it. I would say what happened is money was just too good to turn down at the time, and there was hope at that time that Davis Mills would take a another step. And it's really no knock on him, but it. 
what wound up happening during the season, the play calling with Pep Hamilton wasn't very good, and Davis Mills regressed. Those are two factors that I'm sure at the time he did not expect. He's an optimistic guy, and but what you have to deal with the facts and the truth. And when the season began, and as they went further and further into the season, it wasn't going well. I mean, at the end of the season, I think you all were probably both at the Dallas Texans game. They they played that was kind of a gimmicky game, but the Texans were in it, and they probably should have won. They were running the 18 and 19 option with Jeff Driscoll. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and then the the running back Rex Burkett went the wrong way, and he had to. Uh, I think it was uh, he was running right, so it was 18 option, but he didn't have a pitch man. He's just out there and tried to plow ahead, and you know it was stuff like that. I mean, it was bad. It was, I mean, it was not an NFL level offense in terms of what they were running and what the personnel they had to put out there. They had two tackles, Larry Tunsil, Titus Howard. They had a running back who got hurt against Dallas, Damian Pierce, who's very good. And then they had a couple other guys, you know, like Chris Moore and, and Brandon, and they didn't really have a lot of weapons at tight end. I mean, it was not a complete offense. And, you know, I guess you could say, well, maybe he should have saw all that coming, I, I guess. I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, when they're offering you two years and $39 million, you take it. And he's cashing in. He got $6 million from the Texans. He got $8 million from the Cowboys, and this is all just salary conversions. He'll make the same amount of money, the eighteen million. It's just he makes it now, but he doesn't need it. Like he's, you know, got so much money from so many contracts. Uh, you know, he's someone that I don't think is obsessed with, you know, material things. He just, you know, takes care of his family. Lives fairly simply for someone that has the means to do whatever he wants to do. Aaron Wilson. Longtime NFL insider covering the Houston, Texas for KPRC to in Houston, joining us here on the Get Right with Reggie Cage here on 105 through the fans. So with him now being in Dallas, what's the number one skill set that you think he brings to an offense here in Dallas where last year, of course, lacked a little bit of speed and tried to answer that with T.Y. Hilton a little bit? What's the number one element that you think Cooks will bring to this Cowboys offense? He runs a four three three. Still, <laughs> There's, uh, you know, he can get behind people. He can get deep. He, they showed me once some GPS data. It was uh, like an internal thing, and they had, they'd look at stride frequency and speed, and it's kind of like the next gen stats with the dots, but they can do that to track every single route that you run, and so it shows the how open are you? Like, what's the average amount of distance you're open? And he was the leader in all of that. And his, like the biometric data, the analytics, what it showed is that he was as fast in the fourth quarter as he was in the first. So you get someone who's really well conditioned, like a, like he, what he is, a former track athlete. So ran a 10-200 and was uh, in the Pac-12, running these fast 60-meter dashes. And he's fast. He's very fast. He's got good hands. He's not the biggest wide receiver, but he's tough and he'll compete for the football and he'll make contested catches for someone that's not very big. But he is very regularly open because he's got the ability to separate and he sells routes well. And you know, I don't know what his stats are going to look like, but I would think they'll be good with him and CD, and you know, he'll clear things out. I think this is good for CD. It's good for Michael Gallup, and it's very good for Dak Prescott. Aaron, that's fantastic information. Um, obviously, there was a little bit of a exchange of sorts for the Cowboys and the Texans, as today we found out that Dalton Schultz will be playing on a one-year deal uh, down there, obviously coming from the Cowboys, as well as the offseason acquisition Noah Brown, who was also up here. What's the hope down in Houston for those acquisitions, and what's kind of those moves tell us about what the Texans are trying to do this year? I'm trying to become relevant again, and you know they have empty seats. This isn't like Dallas. When you go to a Texans game, it's absolutely dead. It's empty. It's it was bad. There's just hardly anyone. You can get tickets for twenty dollars and go to a Texans game. That's how rough it's gotten here. So they are trying to become relevant and sell hope with D'Amico Ryan. And they're trying to get some real players in here. As you guys know, Dalton is a prolific tight end. He runs great routes. He's big. He's you know guy that I think is a consummate route runner. And you know, look at the ability to catch the ass, he has some special qualities. He's a good tight end. And, you know, they got him, I think, at a fairly good price, you know, where he can make up to $9 million. 
you think about what he adds, and then Noah Brown gives you special teams blocking. He's an underrated receiver. He's a big receiver. So he gives you kind of a size receiver and a toughness aspect at on the perimeter. And I think that's what those guys add. Uh, I, I like the Noah Brown one well, at the time. I liked a lot more because I had a had the scoop. And then on uh, no, and then on uh, Dalton, I'm a confirm uh, a couple minutes <laughs> after. So yeah, I I like the ones I win. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, you know, because people ask reporters like, "What do you care about?" I'm very honest. I just tell people I like the stories I win on. So that, those are my favorite stories um, when I get to get a heads up and you know you get the green light, you can go with it, that kind of thing. But yeah, no, I'm joking. Sort of. And when you get uh, with a Dalton, I think it's a major upgrade because they only have was like Tegan Clutoriano and Brevin Jordan, and they didn't resign Jordan Aiken. So this is tight end one. That's what this is for them. Last thing before we let you go, Aaron, I want to ask you about this because D'Amico Ryan's coming home, a favorite son of Houston, having started his career there now, the head coach. What's the feeling with D'Amico Ryan's taking over that building and that program and what he is hoping to bring for this organization going forward there? It's big time. You know, he's galvanized the building and the reaction to him from players that I've talked to, like Damian Pierce and several others, like Steven Nelson, uh, Desmond King, Derek Stingley Jr., it's overwhelmingly enthusiastic and they feel like he's a very relatable coach. He's only 38. He's not that many years since his Pro Bowl linebacker days. And, you know, Lovey Smith was more of like that grandfather type, you know, at age 65. So it's different. And so they'll have a younger coach that's, you know, just really probably, you know, that they can have more in common with, and he has a great reputation. So, like, when you talk to a John Lynch or a Mike McDaniel or a Kyle Shanahan or Todd Bowles or a lot of the coaches and administrators that know him or Rand Carthon, uh, I just heard so many stories, and I was getting a lot of phone calls. People wanted to call me back before he even got the job, so Robert Sala – the Jets coach is giving me like a huge recommend, glowing recommendation. I've never heard one bad thing about him. So if I'm talking to O'Brien Cushing, his former teammate, or anyone that knows him in any walk of life, it's the same overwhelming message that this is a high quality, high energy guy, and he's very proficient at teaching. So, and you know, I like what he's talking about as far as caring about the guys first, you know, as, as men, and then you know, showing them whatever he can show them about football. But that's what you have to have. You really, I think, uh, I, I think, you know, some of the buzzwords people talk about compassionate leadership. And I think that's what he's all about. That's a phrase that's come up a lot of times with him. 